Next, we have Dawood Bey. I'm very happy to have him on stage with us. Um, and again, listen, see what you can take away from it. How can it inform your own work? How can it inform your own practice, your students, your, um, your books? Write about them. <laughs> Thank you so much again for coming. And then let's listen to our next speaker, Dawood Bey. Hi, Dawood. Good evening. Um, I'm going to kick this off with a couple of things. I just first um, wanted to introduce myself so you all know who uh, is speaking with Dawood tonight. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Sherman. I am a senior curator at the International Center of Photography in New York, where I've been for just about a year, before which I was at the Whitney Museum, which is how Mr. Bay and I know each other as we work together along with Corey Keller on his retrospective Dawood Bay, an American project. Um, I also want to echo some of the thanks shared at the beginning of the last conversation. Um, first, thanks to Dawood for inviting me here to uh, be in conversation tonight, to CAA for this opportunity for all of us and for so many of you in the room for the incredible ideas and propositions of the last few days. My head is swimming, so that might inform how our conversation goes this evening. Thank you. And then I just wanted to um, because these are two conversations that maybe for some of you feel unrelated, but for me actually feel deeply related and very personally intertwined, to use an ever-present weaving metaphor, um, I thought this question about the discipline and the interdisciplinary um, was a wonderful way of transitioning from two artists, from one artist to another, both of whom are deeply invested both in the discipline and the interdisciplinary. So I think this is a great combination of artists tonight um, in expected and unexpected ways. Um, so Dawood, I thought maybe you could start by talking a little bit about um, your most recent work since um, part of what I think we're here to celebrate is this incredible exhibition up for a couple of more weeks at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, um, Elegy, which is a celebration of three history projects that you've been working on. So maybe we can start by you talking about those three projects. Okay, well, I, 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 might, I might add a little bit of a prelude to that. Or talk about whatever you want to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and certainly I want to uh, formally uh, thank the College Art Association uh, for inviting me to do this uh, artist interview and uh, Elizabeth for agreeing to, I guess you could say, continue the conversations that we have in private and public on stage in front of an audience which is what I consider this to be because uh, we have had and we do have uh, an ongoing conversation that actually began with uh, an exhibition that you curated uh, at the Whitney uh, that uh, an artist that we both have very fondly uh, in common, uh, which is what led me to that exhibition and led me to begin a conversation with you. And uh, which for me was a wonderful conversation because as someone who works primarily within what might be called lens-based art, photography and uh, increasingly film, uh, I've always been aware and I tell people that the work that I do uh, is a piece of a very larger set of interests that I have. Uh, the majority of conversations that I have actually are not uh, with other photographers. Uh, I came up uh, in New York among largely painters and sculptors uh, my first expressive art form was music, so I have a whole community of musicians, and certainly there were photographers 
in the mix of that. But it's interesting as it relates to what we now call uh, in this uh, particular context, this notion of interdisciplinarity, because the community that I came up with in New York was not in any way segregated by discipline. I was as engaged with the, with the photographers as I was with the painters and the sculptors and the dancers and the poets. We were all in conversation and supportive of each other's work. So that's always been my framework, is this broader conversation that takes place in the deepest sense uh, across any uh, presumed uh, lines of discipline, which is why I was so, uh, you know, glad to meet you when you were at the uh, Whitney, because uh, the conversation we had that first time that I met you uh, was not about photography. And I always loved that opportunity to not talk about photography, because there's so much more that I'm interested in. I usually end up getting pinned into a corner and having a what conversation. What camera do you use? <laughs> <laughs> I, came up, I came up in a different moment. Uh, I, I came up in a very broad community in New York, and we were all engaged in conversations around each other's work. You know, the first artist that I started spending uh, considerable time with was the, the group of uh, black painters in New York who were the generation ahead of me, Ed Clark, Al Loving, William T. Williams, uh, the sculptor Mel Edwards. Th those were my first models, actually, of what an artist was and what it uh, might mean to be an artist who was also black, uh, living a life that was uh, committed to making work. So for me, that, that's always been the, uh, the broader context. And I know that's not your question at all. But we can also ignore my question because I have a lot to say about what you <laughs> yeah. just said. Uh, so, so I just wanted to uh, provide that context and to uh, kind of underscore that we met in a conversation initially that was not at all about photography. And now, of course, you're deeply embedded in this conversation about photography through uh, the International Center of photography, that we've kind of crossed in and out of each other's uh, conversations and uh, disciplines, I guess, in a very interesting way. But I think this is also echoing uh, what was just discussed, um, which is that these, these categories that we put artists in, that we put their artistic production in, are often categories produced by those analyzing the work by the academics, by the institutions, the institutions that need to label objects for their cataloging systems, by the conservators, and less necessarily how the artists themselves are either thinking about the objects or, as you said, almost never the conversations that they're actually in. And so for me, shifting my practice to a medium-specific institution has been helpful in recommitting to where, when is the specificity of medium really important and still allowing space for all of these other conversations that are so much a part of how artists live their lives and get their inspiration. Yeah, and I think for me, uh, even, even the uh, recent uh, history-based work, which I'm going to talk <laughs> about in a moment, uh, the way I think about and actually talk about uh, my work has more to do with these conversations that I came up having with other artists, you know, who were not photographers. This whole question of uh, the photograph, uh, not just being a picture of something, but the photograph as a particularly made object. 
the photographic object, the materially made object. I'm kind of hyper aware of this question of uh, materiality and how we use the very, uh, you know, the materials at our disposal in any medium, you know, uh, to make the work that we do. And so for me, just to come around to uh, the history-based work that you see scrolling uh, while we're uh, talking, uh, this work has to do with uh, wanting to, in the contemporary moment, in the present moment, uh, engage very deeply the idea of history. Uh, particularly uh, those pieces of history that are related to the African-American experience in this country, which of course is American history, but looking at that particular piece of it and wanting to make work uh, that uh, engages history, but it's also in the present moment, but that draws you into a deep conversation with the past in order to create uh, this kind of liminal space of the past and the present. You know you're in the present, but the work for, for all practical purposes has no uh, evidence of the contemporary moment, partially through the use of black and white material if these were large scale in color, that would be a very different kind of photograph and a very different kind of conversation. But my choice to use uh, black and white film and material with this work has to do with the fact that black and white material is the material of photography's past. And a large scale uh, color image uh, photograph is a very contemporary kind of object. So I'm making these works at the, uh, at the very particular sites, different sites uh, of African-American presence in the American landscape, wanting to engage uh, both the African-American presence in, within the landscape uh, to engage this idea and history of the landscape uh, as a genre and conceptual uh, frame for the work and wanting to bring to uh, that conversation and that history uh, about the landscape uh, a very specific conversation about the black presence and black bodies within that landscape. So I'm both making work about history, but I'm also always very consciously uh, having a conversation with the history that I operate inside of, wanting to shake that conversation up, bring something into that conversation, to both add something to that conversation and to disrupt those histories while using the language and the material of those histories. So that, that's, fine. Now that, that's fundamentally what this work is about. It's a conversation with the tradition of uh, the landscape and wanting to make work about the black presence uh, within uh, that history of place, uh, American places specifically. Speaking of photographic tradition, um, I've been thinking a lot, especially over the last two days in the, in the panels I've been sitting in, uh, questions that I think are really pertinent right now, questions about documentary photography, questions about truth in photography. And it struck me in thinking about our conversation tonight that I may have in the past framed your work as your early work was your most documentary work in the classic sense. You were out on the street, making images of and people. I think that's a convenient way to talk it's, about but, but, what but I'm people kind of know what you're talking about or what it might look like. Right, but, but I think I'm now, especially that you've done this third 
project in the series. I think in a way this project is more documentary and more an attempt at truth in photography, even if that's in a, a conceptual attempt, than your early work was, which couldn't point to those histories in quite such a pointed way. And so I was curious your thoughts about that relationship to sort of documentary and truth in this there work. There is no truth in any photograph. So I never felt myself burdened by that. Um, all objects are the visualization of a set of ideas. The ideas made visible. And photographs, uh, to me, are no different. Uh, the photographs are my idea about the things that I want to make work about. Because uh, even given the same subject and the same place, if you place two people there with a camera, you're likely to end up with two radically, you know, two deeply thinking people who are bringing some sense of consideration to the subject. Uh, because the work is about an idea. And uh, the thing that I do is to work to get you to believe the idea that I'm invested in, whether it was about uh, the black subject, the person within the genre of the portrait, and wanting to both in those portrait photographs to situate the black subject within a particular geographic space, within a particular community, but also to bring a rich sense of uh, interiority to the black subject, that they're not just social subjects. They are deeply feeling, deeply felt, deeply engaging human beings. And to make visible in the photographs uh, that rich sense of interiority. So that's what that work was about. Uh, yes, it was made in a particular place, Harlem, but it was no more uh, uh, a documentary or a document about Harlem because that community was literally, uh, in the socio and the economic sense, was literally falling apart. There's no evidence of that in my photographs. So am I lying or am I just making work that's about my ideas? You know, the time that I was making uh, the Harlem USA work, uh, some of you may, if you're of a certain age, remember that headline. It was either the Daily News or the Post. Ford to New York, drop dead. You know, go ahead and die. You know, drop dead. And the evidence of that was all around in that community. You know, the evidence of uh, economic disinvestment and the way that plays out in a community. But that was not the thing I wanted to make work about. Uh, I wanted to, you know, my mom and dad had met in Harlem. I had family members that uh, had, uh, that actually still, at the time I was making that work, lived in Harlem. Uh, and those people, uh, people persist through all kinds of circumstances. You know, you can make work about the circumstances or you can try to go deeper and find that common human denominator thing that carries people through that. And that's what I was interested in. You know, so there's no uh, evidence in that uh, decrepitude in the photographs, because that's not my idea. You know, so I think, uh, I think very early on, even as I looked at a lot of what was being called documentary photographers. Uh, I've never been interested in genres. They're, they're kind of meaningless. They're just a convenient way for people to package and market things, whether they're photographs or music. And coming out of music, I ranged from jazz, and I played with funk bands, and I studied traditional West African music. You know, it, it, the, the genre question has never been uh, a meaningful one for me. Uh, it's about a set of ideas and how to make those ideas resonantly visible in the work so that someone standing in front of that work 
feels that it is imperative. And I guess that's been one of the operative words for me uh, throughout my career, to make work that's imperative. I kind of feel all work should be imperative. Now, when I think that aren't imperative, shouldn't exist. Why do we need them? You know, so it's a question of making the work needed in the world, making the work imperative. And there's all kinds of ways that one can do that. But, you know, part of the mission, I think, of being an artist is to figure out why the work that one makes might be imperative. Why do we need this? What ideas are you introducing into the world that will kind of begin to reshape uh, the way people think? So this history-based work is about uh, an idea of liminality, how to make something that uh, is both past and present. When you look at it, you know that because I made it, it had to have been made in the contemporary moment, and yet there's no evidence of that. And they're large scale, so if you stand close to them, the world kind of disappears around you, and you're in the world that's in the space of the photograph. And also, I think this is important to say, and not because I'm trying to keep making false connections between the two talks tonight, but this idea of slow, close observation um, that Anne was talking about. I just want to say, for those of you who haven't seen these bodies of work in person, that is a really key operation in these works, in particular in Night Coming Tenderly Black. Um, the screen makes that body of work in particular much brighter yeah. than it is in person, and it, and it really forcefully insists that the viewer slow down, let your eyes adjust, um, interpret what you're seeing, uh, in the well, to image. have the experience of the work, you know, I've known uh, Anne's work for a long time. I, I love Anne's work. And what I know about Anne's work is from having stood in front of it uh, many times. You know, so I think uh, th these kinds of presentations are always, at the very least, a little problematic for me because there's no experience that can be had that's the equivalent of standing in front of the object that someone has made and letting that thing work on you, rather than a third generation kind of, because my work is not that size and it's not that size, it's, it's, it's none of this. You know, this gives you a sense of what it is and what my uh, ideas are, but there, there's no substitute uh, when talking about art for standing in front of the actual object. And, and so to go back to this idea that you were saying about, we know this is contemporary because we know you stood in these places and made these images. Can you talk about the making of these bodies of work and how they came to be? And I'm, I'm also interested in how, in a way, as you move forward in time in the projects, you're kind of tracing a story backwards in time? Yeah, and that's kind of that's kind of the place that I make this work from, because when I'm on these landscapes, I literally feel like I'm kind of standing in the middle of the past and the present. I'm kind of straddling this kind of space, the space that I'm in and the space that was. You know, there was something I read years ago. Uh, in a book by the New York writer, uh, Pete Hamill. And it was Pete Hamill's book about growing up in New York. And in this book, he was walking through the streets of New York that he knew from when he was a child, a boy. And the thing, you know, the one line in that book that I always remembered is that every place now, the deeper meaning of any place is in what it is and what it was. And every place is simultaneously what it is and what it was. And in order to have the deeper experience of a place, one has to engage with those two ideas, that you're standing in this place that was some other place. And the deeper meaning 
of this ballroom, why it looks like this. You know, there's a whole history that this is in conversation with. Uh, the deeper meaning of a place lies in its past and in its present. So when I'm in these places making the photograph, the first choice that I make is uh, to not present in the photograph any evidence of the present moment. Because looking across the James River, there are buildings there, there's a condo development there, but that, that's not what I want to talk about. So in order to keep you in the space that I want you to be in, there needs to be no evidence of, no conspicuous evidence of the present moment so that the present doesn't intrude on the experience that I'm trying to create, which is more the experience of what it may have felt like to be in this place or what it might have felt like for those black bodies that were formerly inhabiting these spaces to be there. So it's a way of shutting out the world and creating the space that's the space that I'm interested in talking about and bringing to life in the work. So it's, uh, it's a way of making the idea visible in the photograph, which a slight shift of the camera this way, it's a very different photograph. And that might be about the tension between the built environment and the energy. Now you can talk about all kinds of things, but what I want to talk about requires keeping you in this particular space. And if you get close enough to these large scale uh, photographic objects, you know, and I had, uh, you know, I say this, but I actually, when, um, when Night Come in Tenderly Black, uh, the first museum showing of that work was here in Chicago at the Art Institute. And uh, I, maybe I went into the gallery with the curator, Matt Witkowski, or maybe I was meeting a class there. I don't know what it is, but I, 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 I walked into the exhibition into the uh, gallery space while two women were deeply engrossed in the photograph they were standing in front of. I mean, they were deeply engrossed and then startled when they saw me. And I would say they were startled and what was most interesting, they were startled and, mo and momentarily confused and I knew they were momentarily confused because they said, but, but you made these photographs, right? You, you, you made these, you made these recently, right? And so to kind of pull them back in, I said, yes, I made them in 2021 and I, I am, but they had actually, uh, from what I could gather, they were having this deep experience that they, apparently felt like they were in the past that the photographs were evoking. And then they saw me, and they were clearly confused for a moment and couldn't help but ask me, but you made these, right? You know, so I think, uh, I don't always have uh, that kind of firsthand experience because usually in my work is in a space I try not to intrude on the experience because I want it to be about the work and not about me. But that was uh, one kind of uh, interesting and conspicuous example uh, where someone was clearly having the experience that I would hope they were having. And then it was disrupted by my appearance there. Well, it's clear that the images were really transporting and um, maybe this is a a false shift, but in thinking about your capacity to transport the viewer and, and push that further, I know you've talked about one of the shortcomings of photography being its muteness. And going back to your interest in music, 
I thought maybe we could talk a little bit about the film work um, and the role that those projects have played in the history work and the role of sound in those in those videos. Yeah, well, I think my my first I, I have two foundational uh, creative influences uh, inspirations. Uh, both happened uh, when I was very young. And they pretty much, at the moment they happened, changed the shape of the world for me. And the first was hearing John Coltrane. Hearing John Coltrane, I love Supreme. And reading the liner notes, I want my work to be a force for good. I mean, he, he was making this work very intentionally. And he was also making the work at a very a uh, rigorous level, uh, rigorously inventive. He was without question the uh, musician who brought jazz into whatever its future was going to be, uh, brought the saxophone into its next iteration as an expressive instrument. And because he always attached not only the rigor but the intentionality that he was making this work in order to transform the shape of the world, in order to transform the viewer who might listen to it. Which, of course, in instrumental music is one of the profound things, that we feel something without anyone having to tell us what we're supposed to feel if the work is doing what it's supposed to do. Which I think is what one hopes for uh, in any kind of uh, expressive form, is that it will work on the viewer uh, in an almost inexplicable kind of way. So John Coltrane uh, was uh, one of my first, and because I was a very young drummer, uh, Tony Williams uh, was, uh, is an endearing hero for his rigor, his level of expressivity, his respect and high regard for craft, you know, which is uh, something that I have always tried to embody in my own work. And then within my uh, chosen field, Roy de Carava. So my, my two, who I still look to. And de Carava photographed Coltrane. Coltrane. Absolutely. Yeah. So Coltrane and de Carava. Everything that I do, everything that I am, can be traced back to those two, and my aspiration to make work at the level that they did. And of course, Dick Arriba, being a, a photographer, was more immediately, uh, I guess you could say, useful in trying to come to terms with the photographic object as an expressive space uh, because of his deep engagement with the materiality of the photograph, uh, which wasn't meant to document anything so much as to embody in the object itself his response to uh, that experience. And so uh, for me, Dick Arriva is a kind of uh, singular presence in terms of uh, his use of the photographic material and mediums as an expressive space. I mean, before we even met, uh, foundational for me too, at a much different point, his, while not of Coltrane specifically, his photograph of Elvin Jones, the drummer, um, that is a- Bucket list picture. <laughs> we, we'll, we'll buy it together. <laughs> um, his ability to capture the expressiveness of making of a musician and the expression that one might feel listening to that musician. And then in the study of blackness in photography, the completely hidden elements of the symbol in the corner that's only there if you really hunt yeah. for it, he's not, hitting you over the head with what the subject is about. Um, and I know that, that those really deeply black pictures are one of the inspirations for Night Coming Tenderly Black. Yeah, and I think uh, certainly uh, Night Coming Tenderly Black 
those photographs are pretty much uh, there. In addition to everything else that they are, they are my conversation uh, with De Carava, uh around this idea of the blackness of the subject, the blackness of the narrative, and the blackness of the photographic object. You know, uh, his work was a really significant conceptual key for me in the making of uh, Night Coming Tenderly Black, coupled to uh, Langston Hughes' Dream Variation uh, poem, you know, where the last line is, Night Coming Tenderly Black Like Me, you know. And of course, the fact that uh, De Carava and Langston Hughes had a significant collaboration, which would not surprise me uh, at all. Uh, but this idea, night coming tenderly, black like me. If you just take that couplet from Dream Variations, uh, you know, night coming tenderly, black, because we are we're taught to fear darkness. We're taught to fear blackness. But he said, no, night coming tenderly, blackness can be tender like me, you know? The space can be a tender embrace. This, this way of thinking about uh, blackness as not a space of intimidation or fear, but something to be embraced gave me uh, the conceptual and uh, material key for the Night Come Tenderly Black work, which is why it has the title uh, that it does, you know, as a way of both acknowledging that and all of the uh, projects that I've done have titles that come out of different pieces of black expressive culture as a way of alluding to, in a very direct way, the fact that the work is part of that conversation with the history of uh, other forms of black expressive culture. I was actually just going to ask if you could talk about the titles In This Here Place and Stony the Road and, and where they come from. Yes, yeah, Stony the Road comes from a song by uh, uh, James Burton Johnson, which is now called the, uh, the Black National Anthem. And the line is, Stony the Road we tried, bitter the chastening rock. Uh, but it's, uh, it's a very old song. It's a song of uh, affirmation. And uh, whenever I think about titling the work, I always want the title to allude both to my work, but also to the fact that this work is part of a larger history. And in this here place is, uh, comes from a passage in uh, Toni Morrison's book, uh, Beloved, uh, in which she uh, talks about this space, this passage uh, from uh, captivity to freedom and what it means to stand in this place. Uh, so I'm, I'm always looking to other uh, black expressive forms uh, in history for my own keys and inspiration and to keep the work situated in that larger conversation. I want to make sure we don't run out of time and I know we wanted to talk, we wanted to go back even further in your story and sure. talk a little bit about your educational experiences and then maybe leap to the recent present and, and your work as a teacher. Yeah, I've had a, uh, my educational experiences have been uh, rather varied. Um, if you looked at my educational background on paper, it would seem to be completely out of sync with my professional activity uh, because I didn't go about that in the 
in the way that one presumes. One goes from undergraduate to grad, and from grad you have a career. I kind of already had a career before I did any of that. Because when I, when I started, the whole, uh, I guess you could say, professionalization of the field hadn't yet taken hold. Uh, the BFA as a requirement, and certainly the MFA as a prerequisite to being an artist was just not a part of the conversation. And uh, even as an undergraduate uh, in the mid-70s at the School of Visual Arts, I'm pretty sure that none of my teachers or professors had a degree of any kind, quite frankly. Uh, that moment, actually, of being at the School of Visual Arts in the mid-70s was the beginning of the professionalization of the field, but people were still teaching in the field whose credential was basically the credibility of their experience and their history. So that's how I uh, started. And then eventually, now I actually started at the School of Visual Arts, got inv invited to be a part of the Cedar Artist Project midway through, which for me was an easy decision to keep you know, to remain an undergrad here or to go ahead and go back out into the streets and keep making the work. Uh, even as those two years uh, undergrad at the School of Visual Arts were hugely invaluable to me because it, it put me in contact uh, with uh, a broader community than I had at that point and also began to uh, formally uh, introduce me to the history of the field, both of the field and art history in general, because uh, Shelley Rice was teaching an art history course, which was required. And then there was also the history of photography. So that was, you know, I had been buying books and magazines and doing my own, what one might call independent study. Uh, but going to a School of Visual Arts early on uh, was my first introduction to academia. So that was the mid-70s. And I didn't return to a formal academic environment until I went to grad school at Yale in 1991. And all of those years I had been exhibiting, I had been getting fellowships, I, I had a career, even though I hadn't done it that way, but as the field became increasingly professionalized, uh, this question about the MFA came up. And then there was a moment where all of my friends in New York, Carrie Mae Reams, Albert Chong, Lorna Simpson, Louise Stern, they all started disappearing to grad school. And they want to know if I'm going to go. You got lonely. <laughs> <laughs> they they want to know if I was going to go. And uh, UC San Diego was recruiting very heavily, which is why Carrie May went there, which is why Lorna went there. Lorna and I were undergrad classmates uh, at School of Visual Arts. So we already had the beginnings and the makings of our community. But suddenly it was this conversation about the MFA. And I was just making work. I, most of the time when I applied for a grant or a fellowship, I got it because I was making work all the time. That's all I did. Living in New York was cheap at the time, which allowed one to do that. And that's what I did. You know, it became part of the uh, community of artists that centered uh, on the Studio Museum in Harlem and then some of the other, what were called in that, at that time, alternative spaces, Cinque Gallery, Exit Art, Fourth Street Photo Gallery, Midtown Y. That was, that was my community. And the one who uh, convinced me that, as she said, you know, Dari, you might, you, you might want to think about grad school. It'll give you a broader community. And, uh, Carrie Mae Reams was the first person, the first friend. And I thought about it, 
And then 18 months, two years later, she was back from <laughs> UC San Diego. And Completely I transformed. Yeah, because you think about it, grad school is two years. Academically, it's nine months, nine months. It's 18 months. It's a very short uh, period to invest in uh, out of uh, what one hopes would be uh, a long life uh, as an artist. So finally, I decided to apply to grad school. And I wasn't going to go to California. I wasn't a theory queen. I'm not a theory queen. And theory was dominating the conversation. At that time, I'm a deep believer in the object, that the, the discourse and the conversation comes from the made object. Uh, so I ended up at uh, Yale, which was kind of like the last great bastion of late modernism. Uh, as far as uh, grad school, and I wanted the opportunity to uh, to study with some of the people that I knew were teaching there, uh, Richard Benson in particular, and I took film every uh, every semester I was there with a the great filmmaker Michael Romer. I knew Michael Romer's film Nothing But a Man, and then of course the great art historian Robert Ferris Thompson. Thompson was still teaching there. So, uh, so I went back. Uh, it was later than what would be the norm for most people, but it made perfectly good sense to me. Even though my first semester uh, in grad school, I was also uh, in an exhibition at MoMA. Just like every first year grad student. <laughs> <laughs> But that was my life. No, that was my life. I had been in New York for what? Making work for 25 or however many years before that. So I was deeply embedded in that New York uh, community of photographers and artists, but also having a sense that this one thing that I hadn't done, maybe I should think about doing it. And I wanted to go where Howard Dina Pendell had gone, where Martin Perrier went, uh, where folks who were real makers had gone. You know, because that, that was a rigorous program about making. You know, it wasn't about reading theory, although that was fine, but that was not the main focus of the program. It was rigorous. You were expected to make work. And if you didn't keep up the pace of making work, People were actually advised out of the program at the end of the first year because they simply didn't seem to be taking it serious enough in terms of the uh, rigor and the quantity of work that they were producing. And so how did that experience affect your own life as a teacher, which has been such an important part of your life and work, and congratulations on your retirement. Um, but I'd love to hear, especially given that so many people here are dedicated to teaching about that aspect of your life. Yeah, teaching for me has uh, been a way of uh, being an artist and also being present in the world and uh, sharing that with a generation who's coming into the field or others who have some sense that they might want to do this and to both uh, embody in that situation what that means, uh, to embody that in a very rigorous way. And I've also always thought that teaching was as much about uh, trying to teach a certain set of values as it was trying to teach the how-to of uh, the making uh, so uh, I started out teaching. Again, I started teaching before, uh, you know, the field became professionalized. So initially I was teaching in community-based institutions. Uh, I taught at the New Muse Community Museum in Brooklyn. And then I was asked to teach uh, photography classes. At the Studio Museum in Harlem. Uh, Studio Museum in Harlem also had film classes. Uh, and in that first class that I taught at the uh, Studio Museum in Harlem, in came walking a woman named Carrie Mae Reams. 
You know, so those community-based institutions, uh, for me, where my uh, where teaching art actually started before it, it became a part of uh, the more academic uh, infrastructure. But I've always uh, really taught from uh, a place of rigor, uh, commitment, understanding why one is making this work, what conversation are you trying to provoke with this work in the world. And of course, there are multiple conversations that one can provoke, but the need to be self-aware about the fact that you're making this work, not just for yourself, but to put this work out into the world and have someone stand in front of it and engage with it. And to me, it's very important uh, in teaching to try to get students to think about what does it mean to put this work out in the world? and then to try to work with them to get the making of that work to the highest possible le level of craft and rigor. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a deep believer in the fact that the work, that the making of the work and the rigor of the craft should be equally as interesting, if not more so, than the idea. Because it's the making, it's the rigor of the work that allows the work to do what one might hope that it would do once it goes out into the world. So that's kind of been my operative framework. Uh, you know, for most of the year that I uh, taught at Columbia College, uh, I, was, I taught there for 25 years, and a good part of that work was, uh, I, was also, I was always interested in getting students out of the classroom and into the field that they were presumably in training to enter into. So whether that meant taking them to the print study room at the Museum of Contemporary Photography or the study room at the uh, Art Institute or the MCA or the SMART, you know, there's a very uh, vibrant commu institutional community uh, here in Chicago. And uh, I thought it was very important for students, while they were students, to uh, understand what those institutions were and to have conversations with them inside of the spaces of practice rather than inside of some room that has nothing to do with that. It, it's, it's that it's that much more meaningful for me to have that conversation in the field. And so that was always uh, a very big, a big piece of what I uh, tried to bring to uh, my teaching here in Chicago, is to teach within the context of the field and to teach at a very high level of uh, rigor. Before we wrap up, is there anything else you want to say or address? I want to you know, I've, I've led the conversation, so I want to give you the floor before we conclude. Um, I don't know. I think, uh, you know, as it relates to uh, teaching in particular, uh, all of my students have heard me say this multiple times over the year, because I want them to remember it, is that we think by making things. You're not, you're not thinking just to think. The, the making is the thinking. So we think by making things as artists. I once titled an exhibition, Making Knowing, so I, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think you would prefer to answer people's questions more informally after, is that correct? I'm, I'm glad, I'm, I'm, I'm not leaving, so if anyone has any questions, uh, I, I'd be happy to, uh, chat with you briefly after this, so. Thank you so much, Dawood. This was a real you. pleasure. Thank you. Mm. Mm.